maybe I would just start out by uh, maybe uh, starting with you having been a teenage with me. Hey, where did you grow up? Well, I was born in Rio. You were okay, so yeah. we're both Cariocas. Okay. <laughs> uh, I remember as, as a teenager in the 60s that there was a very vibrant film. Um, for us, film was like a big thing. And you could go to films everywhere. We had a beautiful cinema around the corner from where I lived in Leblon, the Miramar, which had all these wonderful films from the 50s and 40s and right, contemporary cinema. And that's where I, you got to know Hitchcock and, and all these various people, including Godard. And uh, there also were, uh, well, there was the dominant cinema, I think, was American. There was also British and French and Italian and some Spanish cinema, some a little bit Latin American cinema. Uh, there was also Brazilian cinema. As I remember, there were some, some good films that we, we liked, and there was a lot of other ones that we didn't necessarily think were all that great. And I remember you used to go to, you, you would go to a, a film you thought was, you wanted to see, but you also had to sit through a Brazilian film that looked like it had been made in about 25 minutes somewhere, not always. Sometimes looked like a Marx Brothers film, which was intentional at times, and other times maybe wasn't intentional. Uh, and all of the Brazilian films seem to try to imitate the, the sort of classical American type style of films, as I, as I remember. We used to really like the good Brazilian films, and we used to sort of be in awe of some of the low budget ones, although you could be more at awe in some of the American low budget ones, like Beach, what was it, Beach Bingo something, or Gidget something. So I was wondering, at this time, with this going on, suddenly comes this. And I'm wondering if we could start by you giving us a kind of a contextualizing, what was happening at that time? Why were these things happening? The situation of the Brazilian cinema, maybe a little history of Brazilian cinema, and bring us up to this point where, how this happened and, and why this happened. Well, let's have a try. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, I think it's, uh, we have to bear in mind that Glauber Rocha doesn't happen alone. I mean, he's uh, not someone who comes and changes the, the cinema in Brazil while nothing else is happening. No. Brazil lived in the late 50s and the early 60s a very important moment, be it on the economic side, on the cultural side, or the historical side of the country. Perhaps only uh, another moment was so important for Brazil, uh, particularly from the point of view of the history of the Brazilian culture, uh, as that period of the late 60s, late, six, late 50s and early 60s, and that was the Modern Art Week in 1922. And uh, because by 1922, what we saw was exactly that uh, uh, visual artists, poets, novelists, uh, people from the theater, everyone, uh, musicians, uh, everyone seemed to, to, to unite and to begin discussing what was to be a Brazilian. So that was a very important moment and it came exactly when Brazil uh, had already 30, 40 years uh, of uh, being a republic after being an European empire, uh, became an American republic. Uh, after being for many, many years a country where you had only uh, the slaves brought from Africa and uh, the few uh, Portuguese uh, that were there from the very beginning of our colonization. Uh, by the end of the 19th century, uh, with the uh, complete abolition of slavery, we had to import uh, labor from everywhere. And so migrants come in millions to Brazil, not only from Europe, Italy, Germany, uh, everywhere in, in, in Europe, but also from Asia uh, and from Middle East and uh, from everywhere. So uh, by the 20s, 
uh, Brazil had already face. It was already, uh, uh, you could easily see this is Brazilian. This is Brazilian and it's the Brazilian nation that's taking its form and beginning to articulate itself. And by the 1922, during this modern art week, we celebrate the end of colonization, let's say, if we can use these. Uh, and we assumed uh, that uh, there was a way to express ourselves. In a sense, you can compare to the, uh, the group of seven here in, 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 uh, in Canada asking what it was to be a Canadian. What is the difference between a Canadian and someone who is not a Canadian? So uh, Brazilian artists, Brazilian thinkers, uh, everyone in the 22, they, what they tried to answer was exactly what, is, what makes us Brazilians so different from the other people, if we are different from other people. And that's also the moment that the two of the, of the Brazilian uh, most uh, talented uh, thinkers um, prepared the manifesto of the anthropophagy. You know that uh, uh, our First Nations uh, were not cannibals, but they practice anthropophagy. Uh, there is a big difference between being an anthropophagus and being a cannibal. A cannibal eats because he wants to eat the, 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 the flesh, the meat of other people. But an uh, anthropophagus, he only eats someone who deserves to be eaten. So only if you are a hero, only if you are a very, very gifted man, a very wise man, when you die, then you, you deserve to be eaten because that's the way you have to incorporate the best qualities of uh, someone who was with you before. So uh, they formulate by them uh, the idea that uh, the Brazilian culture was kind of a, a lesson of anthropophagy. We, uh, we took uh, pieces from everywhere, we benefit from inputs from everywhere, and uh, in a way or other we were able to produce a, a single culture, a single culture that made sense for the whole country. Now, in the 50s and the 60s, we have a different moment a completely different moment, but also a breaking turn, uh, because uh, is when uh, we come back from the war, the war is mentioned here in the film, uh, as part of uh, the, for the participation of Brazil during the war, uh, the, we had to, the, um, the Americans had to help us uh, establishing our first um, steel plant, and from that steel plant uh, in the 40s, we, we had our auto industry in the 60s, and from that point on, what used to be a rural country became a highly urbanized country, and mostly uh, an industrialized one. So, lots of change happened. It was no longer uh, the question of having a formal republic. The people were longing for democracy. They, they wanted something that could be really uh, in the benefit of everyone. Uh, and that's for the first time that you can see uh, this change uh, in all sectors of the society. Uh, for instance, in, in my, my area, of service uh, in the British foreign affairs uh, is from the 60s that we formulate in Brazil the 4D doctrine, which has been the guidelines for the Brazilian foreign affairs, uh, foreign relations for many, many years. Uh, and the 4Ds were, first of all, uh, the development. We had to always bear in mind that we had to, to look for development. The second was, was disarmament. We, we, we had to be very active in favor of disarmament in the world. The third one 
was uh, democracy, and the fourth one was decolonization, because that was the time that uh, decolonization was beginning in Africa, and we knew that it would that would cause quite a lot of changes all over the world. So in the 50s and 60s, with so many changes in Brazil, we will see that uh, we will have uh, Bossa Nova, you have uh, the Brazilian popular music, uh, you will have uh, the first novels by Jorge Amado, you will listen to, um, also you will see visual arts as uh, those uh, made by Helio Sica and others. So for the first time, Brazil was uh, making uh, in the culture uh, a formulation and a work that was not only intended to be seen by Brazilians, but also to represent Brazilians abroad, to be brought to the world and to see, listen, here we are, we are Brazilians, that's what we are, that's what we feel, that's what we do. Uh, Glauber comes exactly at this moment and he is the, 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 the person who uh, does more work uh, on the field of cinema. Uh, but what he does for cinema is what many others were doing by then for, uh, in, in different areas. Uh, so this is a moment that is particularly important for Brazilians and for the Brazilian culture, but it's not something that happens only in cinema. Cinema is just a part of it. It just goes along with great changes and uh, transformations in the whole society. I think that's, that's what uh, uh, Glaube is, and that's why he's so important. But now, it, maybe you can speak to this, but if we're going to contextualize, sorry, if we're going to contextualize, we, for people who aren't totally familiar with it, there was a lot of political upheaval in the country, uh, and he speaks to this to a great extent, and he has a lot of his uh, left-wing ideas, etc., which all his films are about. Uh, but there was also a support by the government uh, for the film industry in that if you walked into a cinema and there was a Brazilian one playing before an American one, that was because the government mandated that, right? So I'm wondering, it seems to me that there was a support for the, I wonder when this started, support for the cinema that allowed Glauber Horsha to be, make his statements about possibly anti-colonial statements, etc. I wouldn't say it's anti-colonial statements, it's anti, uh, you know, um, archaism. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Something a little bit different. Now, uh, persons and institutions uh, many times are extremely contradictory. So, what happened with the military which took power in the 60s it was that uh, on one hand they were extremely conservative as far as economics was concerned, but on the other they are profoundly nationalistic. Right. And then when it came to movies and to cinema, they paid a lot of importance to the fact that Brazil should have its own film industry. So it's, it might sound as a contradiction, and it, it is to, to a certain extent. Uh, but uh, it was the military man, the military regime, who for the first time started to, gain, to give money to, to the new cinema. And that's what uh, made it possible f for uh, artists like Glauber Rocha to express themselves and to start doing their job, their work, which was extremely critical of, uh, in, many, in many instances of, uh, of the regime and of the government itself. What year was that? What year? I'm sorry? What year was that? Yeah, when did they the, start uh, the... A six, well, the, the, the military regime started in 64. Was the support for the cinema the way they forced them to have movies in every cinema all the time. 
Was that in the 60s or did that happen? In the 60s before? also. And then it was cut off for a while, wasn't it, later, and then brought back, I think. Uh, anyway, it was conceived as a good idea. I think as in our music industry in Canada, we did. Yeah, had the same yeah, thing. yeah. But, but it still exists in Brazil. It still is, yeah. Yeah, seriously. Terrific. That's how they created crews. It's cruises. no longer something so crucial because uh, the Brazilian film industry makes quite a lot of money. Oh, yeah. yeah so, and, the, so. and the television industry. Yeah. Was huge. But out of that government intervention, they actually created, uh, had crews, they had studios, they had, for of all course. these small uh -huh. little Marx Brothers type films, they actually created an industry mm -hmm. of this, this thing. But now, what about the artistic context and the literary and, and actual cinematic context? Okay, well, um, is this one? Um, okay, uh, what I was seeing in this film and what I've seen in other films of his are, um, there's on the one hand this idea of creating a national cinema that really speaks to what is happening to uh, Brazilian people, but from a very leftist ideology. And so he has a famous essay called The Aesthetic of Hunger. And he says that Brazilian national cinema needs to be uh, representing what Brazilian, the people of Brazil experience, and that is hunger. And he says our films are ugly, um, but they represent a reality that has never been represented before. But he's also, in terms of kind of his um, filmic references, I don't know if it's on. It's, I don't, it's not on, is it's it? Mine. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that. Um, in terms of his filmic reference, so I was, you know, saying that that the new Brazilian cinema is really trying to speak to um, the working class and to the peasants and to people of the land, and so it's looking into the back country, the the sertão, is that how you say it, um, and. Um, and trying to speak to the poverty and the hunger of the people. But he's also referencing or connected to um, European movements, most, most um, markedly the French New Wave. And he actually worked with Godard and learned from him and spoke to him a lot about how to create uh, this new form of cinema, and also Italian neorealism. And so there's um, use of non-professional actors, handheld cameras. Um, some of these, which what are now conventions, were new um, ways of producing cinema at the time. And it's, but it's, I guess, the other influence that we would see would be earlier, and that would be um, Soviet. So um, the representation of the oppressed class through a series of montage sequences where we're going back and forth from the oppressor to the oppressed and we see these kinds of battle scenes, etc. If you think of Eisenstein or Battleship Potemkin, you see some of those references there. Um, so, but do you want to say more about it? <laughs> yeah, well, uh, talking about this, um, this uh, funding for, for Brazilian cinema, um, there is something that very particular at that time because uh, we could say that uh, with Nelson Pereira dos Santos in 1959, uh, he created these two films that was quite important uh, about favelas in Rio, and then we that we, in a certain sense, he influ influenced the the new generation of filmmakers to do film, and what they were doing it was not just creating cinema for industry, but also they were creating those films in a certain sense of uh, in a collective groups of associations that was reunited in many parts of Brazil, especially in Bahia and Rio de Janeiro. So those associations, they, they were helping them to fund the films, and they were very political films in a certain sense. Uh, one that at the early beginning was Aruanda in 59, that what they made in the Sertão, um, that was one of the, the, the key um, films that they considered the beginning of the uh, Cinema Novo, and then we, we, we have seen how they, they created other films and in this kind of collective uh, work and working together, many, many filmmakers. There was some similarities with the French film uh, Nouvelle Vague that uh, they, were, they were coming from film criticism. So Glauber Hoscher, before starting to do films, he used to write about cinema, so he knew yeah very well the filmography, uh, Eisenstein, and he was a huge fan of uh, Godard. Yeah. That's uh, one of the huge influences that he... But we're going to see this influence later on. I think that's more in the 70s. 
during the 60s, we, we, what we could see it's more related to Brazilian, what he's trying to do in a certain sense was recreating this kind of um, narrative of uh, Brazilian literature, uh, popular literature, but through cinema. So bringing something very, very local, very particular from our culture. If you see some films like uh, the previous film from this one, that was Deus um, Diabo na Terra do Sol, that, uh, what is the English title? Oh. Um, it's so different from Portuguese that all the time I forget. Black God, or Black God and the White Devil. Or something. Yeah. yeah, Black God and White Devil. So, White Devil and, yeah. and this is a, the, it's like, it's not, it's not the sequel, but in a certain sense, it's uh, re, reappropriate the same, same, the same mythology and quite the same space, and, but he's, he do, he's doing something different. Because the first one we have, we can see how much uh, popular literature uh, have influenced uh, the way he, he transformed Brazilian cinema and beca became his aesthetic. So the way that he used music, for instance, with this uh, the singer that uh, tells the story. So um, here we, it's, we have the kind of anthropological way because we have we we hear many different songs and and singers but in the first one we have just one singer like uh that we used to have in cordel that's uh the popular literature so this is becoming like um so in the 60s we we see how he tries to in a certain sense um um bringing something from 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 our society from our culture to his films so these two films it's very uh, related to brazilian literature uh, music and we have seen in the other film in trans earth that Terra trans it's how much that he he was talking about the society and media communication all all this uh the political forces that we used to have and i think it's so <laughs> actually i i don't feel that this film is dated because if you see uh, Hedge Globe in Brazil, it's so similar the way that he was talking about. So it was before what we would learn about uh, how Hedge Globe was created with uh, uh, the help of government and uh, the Americans. That um, So this is one thing. But in the 70s, we're going to see more fragmentation. It's the time of his exile. So it was a very disturbing period for him because for him, it was like uh, to have the audience was one of the most important things for him. And Exile from Brazil, sing after this film, it was something that for him it was kind of uh, very uh, awkward. How, to whom I'm, I'm doing this film? Yeah. What is my audience? Uh, so, now, can I can I ask you because that, that's puzzled me. Uh, even in Tehantransi, it's it's a very intellectual highly stylized film, especially in relationship to everything else that was going on. And in, in this film, of course, it's like it, totally off the wall from popular, what most people were, are watching in, in the cinema. He's talking about making films for the people, he's a leftist, he's all these things, and yet the people these films seem to be made for are more intellectual kind of people, not workers, not the people themselves. And I, f I just can't understand that, like, dichotomy. Maybe you can speak to that. Can I just say one yeah. thing about that? Because um, I didn't, I had mentioned French and Italian, but of course there's also Latin American cinema more broadly in the yeah. 60s and the idea of a third cinema. Um, and I agree, I, and I always feel like there's this weird disjunction between what, um, what illiterate uh, popular classes might be consuming in terms of popular fiction and popular culture. Um, but there is a sense that these directors are really trying to educate people who are not being educated in other ways. And we see it like in the very first scene with the teacher, you know, by rote, mm -hmm. speaking That's to right. the students. And so there is this way that these movies are trying to say, look, this is our history, this is our culture, this is our past, and this is what we should be moving towards. I mean, he says about this film, and I wonder what you think of it, he says that, um, this is a better film than the the one before, the Black God, White Devil, um, because he says that at that moment, that movie was more revolutionary and this one is more reflective. And he says, um, there's a lot less rubbish in it because I'm less bourgeois now than I was then. 
I don't know. I don't. I haven't seen the first one, so. <laughs> I don't know. I think that the first one is so well created. Uh, it's like that. Um, he he tells the story, so it's more linear in a certain sense. This is more. He says this one's more subjective. And yeah. Impressionistic. And this this is one thing very very interesting about Cinema Novo because he was doing this film for the, for the people, but people couldn't understand. Yeah. <laughs> it's like it's too abstract in a certain sense. And uh, we created some kind of uh, That's what, a, what a, happens. a gap <laughs> between the audience and the films, but it was was very well received all over the world, especially if the intellectuals and yes. critics and all the stuff. So it was very, you know, we created this kind of uh, distance between Brazilian cinema and the audience. And this became kind of uh, haunting <laughs> the filmmakers and Brazilian cinema because it was, um, we actually, we break the pact with the, the audience because later on um, in the 70s and the 80s, if you talk about Brazilian cinema, nobody wanted to see because it was so abstract and so hermetic and so difficult to understand. But if you, if you take one of those films and try to understand uh, Brazilian uh, situa political situation and Brazilian mythology, culture, everything is there. Yeah, it yeah. really is. This is what's more amazing about his yeah. work. And because I, and this is one of the reasons that his work is so powerful to today, I think. Well, it's, it's, it's not a film f for the people, but it's about the people. Mm -hmm. And uh, has uh, the great merit of bringing into art uh, expressions and manifestations which were from the popular uh, manifestations and, uh, from the people itself. Uh, you mentioned, and even in this film, most of the narrative is made with uh, uh, the cordel. The, 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 they, they sing, they don't, they don't, they don't say the, 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 the lines, they, they sing their lines, and it's, the, it's exactly like the, the singer does in the market. Uh, he tells a story, singing a story, and he's paid for it. Now, so uh, what he does is he uses the popular themes, he uses the popular subjects, but of course he's someone, first of all, he's not rural, he's urban. <laughs> Second, he has a, uh, he's, he's an intellectual, he's not someone who, who has a, a poor uh, literacy and uh, a poor education. So it's, uh, but uh, the great merit I see is that uh, he succeeds in creating a new way of uh, doing cinema in Brazil. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this is, I think, his biggest contribution. One thing I find it, talking to people, Canadians who have never lived in Brazil, and they will see films like this and they think it's a fantasy. And in fact, for me, most of that's sort of real. I had the Cangaceiro hats as a kid in my, in my room, you know, and, and Lampion was one of my heroes. You know. And they talk about Lampion all the time. He's one of the most famous people in Brazilian history, and he was a bandit a rebel, right? And all the, the, that beautiful dancing, and even in Tehran Transi, the, the, the political kind of energy in, uh, that was going on was all just around you all the time. And it was, to me, despite all that abstraction and everything, it's still very real and, and very much out of what truly was Brazilian, which is probably what he, he really captured and what the Cine Novo was really capturing. Yeah, this the invention of the people that Deleuze, Gilles Deleuze used to say. But one, one thing that I, I think is very interesting from, from Deleuze, Diabo, Natal, and Sol to this one uh, is because the first one, it's uh, black and white. So yeah. we have these two forces, the devil and God. And now we have this uh, kind of syncretic religion. So we have the candomblé, you have the all other yeah. religion manifestations, and it is a color. So it's more like a mm -hmm. uh, nuance <laughs> of the, the, the world. It's There's all, a lot more sides. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you see the, the bandit uh, go back and forth. He doesn't know actually to, to where bel what believe, because in the first one we have this kind of dichotomy between I believe in God or I believe in devil. 
And here we, we, we are in this kind of uh, in between in a certain sense. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to interpret this, this but I think it's, uh, it's part of his uh, subjective side. But there's also a kind of creating that Lampion, Cangacero figure into a kind of saintly figure, right? And rebellion is a, a sa saintly act in a way. So that whole religion tied into his philosophy, his political philosophy, and all that. also I thought the colors looked like you know they used to have the the Saint George uh, pictures that they would sell you in the market, <laughs> you know, and the colors seemed to be like the same ones as in the film. Do you remember that? Well, they had the Saint George at the beginning. They actually had it in yeah. the in the movie, yeah. yeah. But he's I mean he's a he's got the religious aspects because of being with the Santa, who's there like one of the figures, but. He's also, I mean, he's a 60s revolutionary hero, right? I mean, he, he could be, yeah, uh, in, any, in Latin America, I mean, he could be Che Guevara or he something. He was a Che Guevara like. of movies. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, that he's, he's a folkloric bandit, but he's a 60s revolutionary at the same time. And that, that's interesting to pick up those um, historical aspects, and, but a very um, political present moment. Absolutely. I think. Could I ask you about the visual style? I saw in Terra and Transi, it seems to me it's kind of like Breathless and Fellini, and then like the end shots you have uh, the seventh seal. The last shot of the seventh seal is the last shot of, of this film with him dancing on a hill as he's dying. And it's like, mm. But I'm, I'm challenged to find the European like references in this last film. Uh, do you have any thoughts on on the visual style, it seems to have developed totally in a different direction from, from uh, Lair than a trance. And this film reminds me a lot of uh, Godard. <laughs> like, uh, later Godard. Yeah, yeah like uh, right. this one. Le Chinoise, um, hmm? Le Chinoise. And the other one, uh, I forgot the title, but um, we have this kind of trance. And how, how he, he makes pol politics and, and, and love and this kind of uh, trying to, um, this kind of discourse that all the time comes back. I, 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 I feel a lot of, uh, I feel that we have some kind of uh, changing in his aesthetic for this one. And, and less derivative the, uh, from Europeans, uh, mm. to me. Are there any questions? Anyone would like to uh, have any comments or observations? Yes. Um, actually, I have two uh, uh, comments or questions. Uh, maybe I just start with one. If uh, we have time, we can. Later. People here, how about you? <laughs> Thanks. Uh, one thing is that uh, uh, we always, when we hear Sam uh, Novo, we hear. Glover Rocha, actually he says that I am Cinema Novo. Yeah. But uh, there are actually, there are other people too, like Roy Guerra, or Nelson Pereira de Santos, and uh, uh, so on and so forth. I, I'd like your, like any or all of you, to comment on uh, the influence of Glover Rocha on others and others on Glover Rocha, and then the whole uh, movement, has, uh, movement of Cinema Novo and other Latin American filmmakers, like Miguel Letin, for example, uh, letters from Marussia, and so on and so forth. It, it's, it's very much uh, influenced by uh, uh, Glover Rocha. And the other thing is, like, this is Diaspora Film Festival, so maybe you can comment on his diasporic side of uh, film, like uh, uh, Lion with Seven heads or like African productions, his African productions or uh, European productions as well. Well, I could say a little bit about um, uh, other Latin American cinema. I mean, the kind of two films that I was thinking about uh, a lot, um, I mean, there there's the whole, that I mentioned, the third cinema manifesto and this idea of how to make a different kind of cinema that would speak to the realities of Latin America. And that's a pan-Latin American um, cinematic movement or manifesto. Um, 
in Cuba, Cuba has a, has a lot of similarities because after the revolution, it's trying to, its filmmakers are trying to make a, a cinema that will educate the people and they can be very abstract. I think one of the most famous ones is Gutierrez Alea's Memories of Underdevelopment. And Glauber Rocha talks a lot about the underdevelopment of Brazil and of Latin America and how um, filmmakers need to embrace this and understand this underdevelopment and represent it in, in, in both formal and formal ways and contextual ways. Um, Memories of Underdevelopment was, uh, it's a difficult movie to understand. You don't even know whose side to be on. When, when I teach it, my students are confused. They can't tell if it's a critique of the main character or if he's the main character and we're supposed to believe in his kind of bourgeois ideals and his criticism of Cuba's underdevelopment. And, and that movie and other movies that were being made at the time were being taken around in vans to rural areas in Cuba because they were supposed to be educating the people. I don't know if anything like that was happening in Brazil, but there was really a sense that cinema was the way to speak to the people, to represent them and to speak to them. Um, Oh yeah, and I was just gonna say, uh, a film that I um, really like that, that is um, one of the films of Cinema Novo, and it's um, Pereira dos Santos, um, How Tasty Was My Little Frenchman, and it picks up on these ideas of anthropophagy um, because it's about the interactions between Europeans and indigenous peoples and the eating of him, but not until, the, the eating of the, um, of the European, but not before he has learned their ways and become one of them and become good at being one of them. And he thinks that that's going to save him, but that just makes him more edible. Um, and so that's, <laughs> that's an interesting twist on. And Glauber Rocha talks about anthropophagy. I mean, he, he's definitely very aware of that as kind of one of the most important um, thoughts of, of Brazil and how, what it means to be Brazilian, and that is, um, the eating of the, he even talks about in this movie, he talks about how all the characters are eating each other and that they take aspects from each other. That Antonio das Marches uh, eats the cangaceiro. Okay. Uh, uh, sorry, change language. <laughs> Talk about Globio Hosh, speaking Portuguese. But um, one thing very in, uh, important in his career was actually his exile, so related to diaspora. Um, and it started just after this film, 69. He went to, he went to many countries, uh, Cuba, and then he went to Paris, um, Spain, uh, Italy, and he, he filmed in all these countries. In Cuba, he made the history of Brazil. It was an amazing documentary that he, he, he recreated the Brazilian history only with um, Brazilian f from Brazilian films, images from created by Brazilian cinema. So he recreated the, the whole uh, Brazilian history. And he took like uh, 10 years to, to finish the film, to edit. It. it was a huge uh, work. Um, and then he went to Africa and all the European countries. And, but the most interesting that I think it was Claro, uh, made in 75, when he was in Italy, and he, at that time he was, uh, he has, um, his wife was uh, Juliette Berthaud, uh, one of the main stars of uh, Godard's and Nouvelle Vague's uh, films. Um, and it's very interesting because it was the first time that he's in front of the camera. And he's very nostalgic, it was, uh, his sixth year in exile so he was um, after six years he was like um, um, very it's not it's not just the the sadness and the the feeling saudade nostalgia of brazil but it was also something was missing to his career to his films to to his work and at that time that he he made a pact with uh, the militaries and he, he called them like uh, the genius uh, one of the militaries, uh, Gobiri, Gobiri uh, it was a, the genius of the, the human race, a human kind. It was kind of uh, huge at that time. And filmmakers, intellectuals in Brazil, they, they wanted to kill him. They, they were very 
um, they, they were criticizing him about this this uh, statement but it was we need to understand that he was uh, he couldn't uh, go back to Brazil he, he was um, he didn't know what to do outside uh, he was feeling that people couldn't understand his film Claro actually was um, it was it's it's one of the most uh, uh, complex and abstract films ever nobody couldn't could stand the film uh, but it's it's very interesting to see how much um, uh, energetic he was at that time and how much Godardian he was too you know um, everything makes all kind of genre um, and the last scene uh, you can see him smoking marijuana with his wife and and singing Gal Costa's song um, to the camera and you you feel the first time Hasha as a human being you know um, and, and, that, and then he, he go back to Brazil and he became this kind of a, um, very, how can I say, um, active person in uh, Brazilian society. He, he started a um, uh, television show, uh, Abertura, uh, four years later. And this, this TV show was uh, very active and, and he very dynamic. He was talking about everything. So uh, sometimes people couldn't understand anymore Glauben Hauser because he was talking too much about everything. <laughs> so um, yeah, it's, it's part of this his process of exile. And, and you can see in those films, uh, he made many films, and uh, their lion has set cabezas. For instance, in, in Africa, Claro in Italy, and many others. Um, so you, you can see how it's going, how it's changing uh, his aesthetics, how much uh, complex become and, and more European in a certain sense. He reckoned himself, like he lived a long time. He died quite young. Yeah, he was, but he started with the age of 20. Wow. And his first film was in 62 with the Barra Vento. Um, he was uh, 23, I think. So, um, yeah, he was, the, the last film was in 82, 81, um, with Idade da Terra. He was like 41, 42. Well, he died at 42, so he really did a lot. Yeah. <laughs> and he wrote a, a, a novel, um, he, he, he wrote a lot. And he didn't come from like Rio or Sao Paulo, he came from Salvador, right? Bahia, Bahia. which was not exactly the biggest metropolis to, an important metropolis. But okay, do you, do you want to talk about that for? No, no. This is a traditionally one of the most uh, the most most cultured culture. Yes, okay. Recife, Salvador, uh, are extremely important. So he would have gotten that cultural impulse of course, from of Salvador. Course, of course, he didn't move to oh, Rio yes, or somewhere. Yes. Yeah. Right. This is not by chance. With uh, Caetano Veloso. Uh, Gilberto Gil, yeah, all that come from Bahia. Actually, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> and if you go into the colonial history, you'll see the number of uh, writers, uh, poets, uh, also from, from that area. So were there, what were the other cultural centers in Brazil at that time? In the 60s? Yeah. Well, mainly Sao Paulo, Rio always, but also Recife, Salvador, uh, Porto Alegre, the big cities. Right. Yeah. yeah, at that time in the Northeast, uh, it was quite uh, uh, active in, in, in cinema too. We used to film a lot in the Recife, Bahia, all these countries, all these states. And, and the subject here is clearly a subject from the northeastern part of Brazil. Yeah, clearly. This is, this is not something that you would see in the southern part of Brazil or southeastern part of Brazil. We, we have to bear in mind that Brazil is, is almost as big as Canada. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's the fifth largest uh, country in the world. We are speaking of uh, a big portion, but not, uh, not more than one-sixth or one-seventh of, uh, of Brazil. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That was that his reality. Um, yeah, I have a question. I to go back now to the idea of the Bayou. Um, I have seen this film, I haven't seen this film for about 20 years, and I came in, I was teaching, on the one line that I recall from this film, which was, 
God made the land and the devil made barbed wire. So the, uh, what it struck me this time is, uh, you know, it looks back towards anthropophagy, but forward towards tropicalism. I mean, the images, and sort of like, I don't know how to characterize, but trying to drive beyond cliche to see if you can read something, uh, very much reminded of tropicalism. But uh, the other thing I was going to say is how it mashes and is able to suggest several Brazils at the same time. Um, and I had not noticed, I had noticed 20 years ago the Baja Vento bar in the city, but I had not noticed the Alvorada one with the Nehemiah designs of, of, of the Palacio Alvorada. Uh, so in the middle of that uh, archaic Brazil, you have this idea of the, the most modern, the most, uh, most modern Brazil. So. And that goes with the singing too, but you have, you have the archaic in the cordel, and all of a sudden you have the operatic thing as they're being dragged. And then a samba that I think is very much a real, which I think is uh, much different from the from the cordel. Yeah, yeah. You could see that the all, all uh, kinds of Brazilian music are very well represented there. <laughs> so, and not only the, 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 the traditional music from the Northeastern, but uh, from everywhere in Brazil in different time, different periods of the history as well. So, and, uh, I think this is this, this second movie. Uh, you, see, you see the difference in Antonio das Mortes. Antonio das Mortes in the first movie, if I can, if, if I still remember, it, after so many years, he was, you know, uh, the guy who was going to to fight Lampião, and Lampião and Curisco, of course, uh, uh, have always been looked at by uh, intellectuals in Brazil as kind of Robin Hoods, not exactly as the bandits they were. Uh, but uh, they were at the same time this kind of, uh, you know, revengers, uh, people who would perhaps be able to, to lead a real revolution in the backland and the very, very, very archaic system that you had in some parts of Brazil and that you still had, despite the rest of the country, was already in, 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 in industrial. Uh, era, the, 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 the northeastern part is still was there in the uh, rural back, uh, backland, but terribly, terribly uh, poor. Um, so, the Antonio de Mortis in the second one is uh, he he he's conscious of the fact. That the fight is not the fight between Lampion and himself. The fight is a different one. It becomes a political one. Although he says to the professor, now politics is with you, I take care of the rest. Uh, when he, 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 he goes back and goes to the Santa, and she says, well, I, I'm. Uh, I'm so ashamed of what I had done because I was completely mistaken. So it's, I think this is Antonio de Mortis that realized for the first time that he has, although he says he's not able to, to, to deliver it, that he has a political responsibility and a, res a political view. He becomes a revolutionary here. Not uh, is no longer someone who is fighting uh, uh, most of not only a mythological fight uh, battle, but also uh, you know a religious one. It's, it's now it's, uh, we are talking about uh, something different, and that that's why you you see this also uh, the priest, the saint, uh, uh, everyone changes. Is no longer what he or she used to be and become something different, because the country is becoming something different. Can I ask you? This is just apropos of almost nothing, but 
Lampio and Mar Maria Bonita, when you see pictures of them, they look like left-wing intellectuals if you take their costume. I mean, he's got little round glasses, a small kind of person, she's kind of pretty. Were they actually, was there any element of revolution apart from what most bandits have? Were, or did they have that intellectual evolution or? No. No. Definitely no. Okay. Because at the same time that they, they use to fight some landowners, uh, they were hired by other landowners. <laughs> so it's, it's, uh, there was no, co no coherence. Of course, the, there was a large, a, a tremendous sympathy because there was someone who, who was able to fight and to win battles against the police and, uh, the, and the, the, the great uh, landowners. Uh, but uh, uh, he, more than once, he was associated with uh, landowners uh, as well. So it's, uh, if you look at <laughs> Things as they were, uh, the history is a little bit different. You just burst my whole balloon. Yeah. <laughs> Are there any other questions or comments? Any other questions over here? Yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering, I mean, not to reduce it to being a, sort of a simple um, uh, kind of a, a comparison to an allegory or anything like that, but what, was this film seen to be threatening in some way? To the authorities who uh, funded, you know, the 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 bureaucracy. Obviously, you said um, supported the the military regime, supported filmmaking because they wanted to support Brazilian culture. I'm gathering. You've already alluded to the fact that uh, really the common people, the average person, was not uh, really moved by this film or wouldn't go to see it. Am I correct in assuming that? So. What, was the scene as somehow threatening to the military government? And is that what led to his exile? What, what was it, uh, I mean, for instance, in, in Iranian film, some of the stories are very simplistic uh, on, on a level. Um, um, but, but to the people who see them, both to the intellectuals and also to people who are resisting you know, the, uh, the dictatorship, um, they see a message in there. And it's very clear. Was this the case with this film? Was was the, 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 the both the intellectual class as well as people, let's say, who may have not been part of the bourgeoisie, who were just ordinary film goers, was what what impact did this film have at the time? And and it was it the the reason that he was forced into exile? Can you just explain some of that? Uh, yeah. By that time, by that time, I was uh, my first here at the university. All of us, of course, we are always anxious to see now what Glaube is going to do. So, uh, of course, uh, ordinary people do not understand what he was saying. Ordinary people was not attracted to the kind of, by the kind of movies he was making. Most probably, ordinary people uh, were much more interested in, you know, uh, watching TV, uh, the comedies in TV, and when they go to the movies, perhaps to 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 watch Doris Day in Rock Hudson, uh, which was pillow talk. That's, that's, that's it. That's it. Okay. Now, but. Uh, when Glauber uh, did his, his movies, uh, old intellectuals, or those who thought they were intellectuals, uh, used to pay quite a lot of attention. And the repercussion in the leads was extremely important. Extremely important. Uh, for some reason, he was forced into exile. <laughs> For so, for some reason, he was forced into exile. Perhaps even then, the military uh, were overestimating his real power. <laughs> but uh, the fact is that those people who, in cinema, in music, uh, uh, in theater, kept doing their work and tried to, to, to preserve their work uh, 
from censorship and try to affirm what they believed, well, they were responsible for keeping intelligence uh, alive uh, throughout a long period of our, of our history. And uh, we cannot forget that um, um, the influence of these films outside Brazil. So um, since the beginning with Baha 1962, he's starting to call attention of people uh, all over the world. Uh, so uh, with this job, Natal Saul, Black God, White Devil, um, he started to, um, um, to receive many prizes, all, many festivals, and those films were, were uh, very well received by intellectuals and in those countries. Um, so is that why he would have been seen as a threat? Because these films were somehow commenting on the political situation in an allegorical way? And censors, they are stupid sometimes, you know? They, sometimes they don't understand also what, what he's trying to say. So um, in Trans Earth, it was clear that we have a political statement there. So it was censored at that time. But when it was censored in Brazil, he was already released in festivals outside Brazil. So the message was there, you know, outside. And the censorship, it's, it's a very uh, complex um, uh, process because sometimes you're going, you're going to censor uh, the conception of the film and sometimes the production, sometimes it's the post-production, sometimes it's only in the time of releasing the film. So we never know how how it's going to do, you know what I mean? So in, that, in this time, um, when the film was, was um, he finished the Entrance Earth and he sent uh, for the festivals, it was before to really try to release in Brazil. So when we tried to get the, the and I love the poster because we have the censor <laughs> dates there. It was, <laughs> it, it was not approved, you know. So was filmmaking at that time reliant on a government support system um, for, In for indigenous films, which it isn't now. I mean, now there's a, 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 a support base, a consumer support base for films. Am I correct in thinking that? Well, we used to have some kind of funding, but um, uh, in 69, the uh, government created Embra Film. So Embra Film became the huge uh, um, uh, producer from the government, and um, at that time, that they are starting to concentrate all the production. Um, before that, they used to have some kind of funding, but also used to have some kind of uh, collective because it was was cheap films. This is the first big production that he had, uh, Antonio das Mortes, but it was co-funded by, uh, I, I think it's a French or a French producer. So it wasn't all Brazilian state money that went into making this film. Right? Antonio does not no. No, it was uh, uh, international co-production. And because of that, we, we have uh, in French the first uh, image and character. It must have been one of the first, if you could. I'll just ask this. Uh, one of the first kind of uh, co-productions then with European and uh, Latin American country where, where there was funding coming from outside, I would think, or am I? Wrong I, I remember that Orson Welles went there to, to make a film, but I don't know co-production. <laughs> yeah, Ofel Negro was a co-production. That was actually quite a big production. Yeah, co-production. Beautiful. I think there's been co-productions from yeah, the beginning. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. I mean, Eisenstein went to Mexico and, mm -hmm. and Buñuel. I mean, there's kind of always been these interactions. Yeah, because uh, cinema in Brazil started since the beginning, since the, the first films we used. Sometimes we used to say that uh, cinema was invented in Brazil <laughs> because you have some first images of Bahia de Guanabara in the Rio de Janeiro. One of the first images yes. Is that right? created. Yeah. So, um, so since the beginning, we, we started to, to create an industry. What we had, we, what we failed was the distribution. Mm. All <laughs> uh, the French and the Americans arrived very early. Uh, since the, the beginning of the century, they, they were there and they're still there. Uh, yeah. <laughs> unfortunately, and this has created a huge uh, problem for for the development of uh, Brazilian cinema to today because they control the whole distribution of theaters. And at that point, it's like um, um, even though we produce today 100 films, but we don't have theaters to show them. Yeah. So we need film 
uh, festivals to to show Brazilian cinema, but, but we have a big production. Has Brazil benefited from television the way Canada has, where we don't dominate, we can't dominate the theaters, but we can dominate the, our television? The Brazilians were always uh, jealous about the co-productions that the television used to do in in Europe, for instance. Okay. I remember that Carlos Jags in the nineties, he was uh, complaining why television uh, don't uh, why we don't have co-production between television and cinema, why you don't create this kind of right. partnership. And uh, he, he made the first attempt, it was not very good, very successful, but this is was when the, the cinema in Brazil was completely, um, you could say almost dead. It was trying to survive, was one of, one of the first attempt. But um, what we have now, it's, um, it's not this kind of partnership they, they w wanted to have. What we have is that television, uh, especially Rede Globo, saw cinema as a very, um, how can I say, it's a, a product that works today. So they started to produce films. And today, they, they at least four or five films per year make one million uh, spectators uh, in theaters. So now they have all kinds of uh, kind of co funding and production. Um, so, but this is this is a very specific case. It's not in general. I, I noticed that in the headlines today that Cineplex has had it's at its highest peak financially ever, if you can imagine, despite everything. <laughs> And um, I'm wondering, are the theaters actually still, are there still a considerable number of theaters in, in Brazil? Or is it, is you, it sounded like they were, you're saying there were many fewer than there used to be. There used to be yeah, fewer. fewer. Yeah. But it's still a strong presence. In the capitals, I believe. Yeah. yeah. Like here. Cineplex. Yeah, the Cineplex. Like here. yeah right, exactly. Same situation. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Same thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, perhaps we should wrap it up. I'd like to thank you very much. This has been really, really interesting and exciting. And uh, thank you all for coming. And um, good evening. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.